will happen. So now we already uh, we will link with Dr. Park. Hello, Dr. Park. Good morning. Hello, Dr. Park. Good morning. Are you there? Yes, Dr. Park. Good morning. Who's who's that? It's Pastor Klinger. Klinger? Yes, sir. Klinger, the evangelist. Yes. Wow, see you. Yeah. <laughs> Who are you now? Good morning, sir. <laughs> Where are you now? I'm in uh, Los Angeles. Oh, you're not in Las Where? Vegas? Huh? You're not in Las Vegas? No, I'm in Los Angeles. I'm in Southern California. Okay, good. We are waiting for you. Okay. Thank you so much. I uh, forgot. Well, Wangla, because I'm a, I'm an old man. I, I forget many things. <laughs> uh, we thought you were sleeping. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for your kindness. Thank you. Okay, it's okay. It's okay. Now it's the time for Pastor Park, Doctor Park. Dr. Park is a professor of this spice, discipleship and church growth here, and also director of Big Four program. And not only that, he's a director of MMIN program here in IAS. So we're very delightful to have him here. Uh, after this presentation, he's going to answer any questions about uh, his topic. His topic will be uh, discipling, retaining, and reclaiming. Discipling, retaining, and reclaiming will be his topic. Just before we invite to present his paper, shall we just say a word of prayer? Let's pray. <clears throat> Our gracious, loving Father in heaven, this morning we are so thankful for uh, this IAS Asian Theological Forum. And we also want to thank you for the presenter who have present their present papers. And also thank you for the introduction, the question and answer. And this time we are going to have another presentation by Dr. Jim Park. Please bless him as he present and bless each and one of every one of us who are here and so that we may be benefit from this presentation, and we may be use this presentation in the future of ministry. And we submit and commit ourselves into your hand during this time. Please be with us through your Holy Spirit. All these blessings we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Hello, Dr. Park. Okay. So yeah, now is your time, please. Thank you. Liang, do we have the keynote up? Is you know? Yes, already. Okay. okay. Thank you so much. As you see, this is my opening slide. It's also my closing slide. We see the member is in the middle, and surrounding the member, there's conversion on the top. There is community on either side, and there's that very important quotation from Ellen White: "The work done thoroughly for one soul is done for the many." And the title of my topic today is Conversion, Community, and Care Genuity. Care Genuity means in this postmodern age, in this secular age, urban age, we have to figure out ways, creative ways to, to care for the people.
that have been entrusted to us. Okay, the next slide. Um, here is a, a graphic um, um, that says uh, we have three figures here. Number one, we have the book membership. A book membership is 100% of the members. Let's say we have a church of 1,000 members. Their book membership would be 1,000. Um, usually around the world, the attending membership is half a book membership. So if you have a book membership of 1,000, you would have an attending membership of 500. Um, what Ellen White says in Christian Service, page 41, she says not one in 20 members registered on the books of the church are really ready for heaven. So what she's saying is the discipled members of the church is certainly not 100%, it's not 50%, it's only 5% of the members, which if you have 1,000 members would be um, 20 members. Imagine that. Ellen White says um, only 5% of the members, 20 out of 1,000, uh, would be ready to um, accept Jesus as he comes. So this is a large problem in the church. Um, we really need to work on that 5% number. Uh, the book membership really, in some ways, is meaningless. The attending membership tells us who comes, but we should always keep in mind that the truly discipled members are going to be less than even the attending members. Okay, Leon, do you have that graphic up? Okay, the, the uh, next slide. Leon, do you have my next, next slide? Okay, okay, good, good, good. Now, Morris Fenden, who was a very uh, influential Adventist preacher, um, I had the privilege of having him as a teacher at Pacific Union College when I first got converted, and he wrote a, one of the only books on conversion ever written, not only in the Adventist church, but also in the broader evangelical church. And this is how he starts out his book on page seven. This book is about conversion, the most neglected topic in the Christian church, he says. To the careful searcher, it is also the most important topic. Ellen White called it the greatest miracle. So Ellen White says that the greatest miracle that Jesus has on the planet and has always had is the conversion of the human heart. He says as he, he went to the CD-ROM disc of Ellen G. White's writings, there I found 9,000 references on this topic. So he's saying, uh, on the one hand, although it's a very important, probably the most important topic, um, it is also the most neglected topic Certainly Ellen White didn't neglect the topic. And um, I like to speak a little bit about conversion and its importance to the church today. Okay, the uh, next slide. In the parable of the sower in Christ's object lessons, Ellen White um, is referring to each of the four um, seeds as it fell upon the different grounds. About the stony ground here, she says, they may appear to be bright converts. They appear to be bright converts, but they have only a superficial religion, and they will not endure when the test comes. So here we have an evangelistic campaign. We have someone who is excited about coming to church. They may appear to be on fire, but Ellen White says they only have a superficial religion. Like the plant, it only has a superficial root system, and when trials and temptation comes, they do not endure. In contrast to that, we have the fourth group of people on the good ground. Notice the difference in this group of people who are truly converted. Christ's Object Lessons, page 60. With the whole heart, with undivided purpose, he or she is seeking the life eternal at the, and at the cost of loss, persecution, or death itself, he or she will obey the truth. Um, we live in a consumer type of society. Some people feel that the song service is not quite right. If the preaching is not quite right, they're not going to go to church. But this particular person who's converted, 
I don't care if it's raining, if it's snowing, if they're sick, if they're tired, they will obey God, they will tithe, they will keep the Sabbath, they will be healthful living, and the truth will mean everything in their life. And these are the type of people, the thoroughly converted people, the church needs to nurture and have a goal for all of its members and for, and for us as ministers as well to have this whole heart, totally devoted personal life to God. Next slide. Even, uh, there's lots of uh, quotations, of course, Ella White makes this particular one, Evangelism, page 308. All who enter upon the new life, she calls conversion, of course, the new life is another word for conversion, should understand prior to their baptism three things. Number one, the Lord requires the undivided affections. You cannot be half the Lord's and half the world. Number two, the practicing of the truth is essential. That is to say, if they have some practices that are not in harmony with the Bible, they should, they should commit themselves to practicing of the truth prior to their baptism. That is to say, they should stop smoking prior to their baptism. They should deal with the living girlfriend prior to their baptism. They should deal with the pork eating prior to their baptism. They should deal with the Sabbath keeping prior to their baptism. And then she adds, there is need of a thorough conversion. So it's very obvious here that before baptism, there needs to be this thorough conversion that is exhibited then by the practicing of the truth prior to baptism. The undivided affections are given totally to God prior to baptism. A very important statement I think if a church was preparing candidates for baptism, if they just had this one statement, um, they would have guiding, they'd have wonderful principles to help them understand what to do with their baptismal candidates. Next slide, please. She mentions on the same page, the test of discipleship. By the way, she has a whole chapter in Steps to Christ called the test of discipleship. The test of discipleship is not brought to bear as closely as it should be upon those who present themselves for baptism. When they give evidence that they fully understand their position, they are to be accepted. So even back in 100 years ago, when Ellen White was writing this, more than 100 years ago, uh, she, she was saying, we are not bringing the test of discipleship as close as it should be upon those who present themselves for baptism. So even then, she was urging for a close uh a, a, a close test of discipleship. <clears throat> now, I'll ask a question here. Could it be that at times, for a variety of reasons, the church has either baptized less than converted people or not discipled them, which has resulted not only in missing members, but even more serious problems? See, usually when we talk about people who are not thoroughly converted, who are not thoroughly discipled, um, we say, well, the ultimate result is they don't come to a church. But I want to show you, my friends, there are far deeper problems um, that non-converted people can take. Yes? Okay. Next, next slide. Um, I had an early Ph.D. student named Foditas. Um, he was in Rwanda at the time of the genocide. In Rwanda... In 100 days, 700,000 people were killed. It was an ethnic uh, conflict. It was the Hutu against the Tutsi. Hoditas was Tutsi, and he was being hunted down every day by various miracles, many miracles. He was able to survive. Almost everyone in his family, except for his sister that I met, survived. Now, notice what Hoditas says. At the end of this study... It appears that thousands of Christians were involved in genocide because they were not truly converted. He goes on to elaborate, elaborate that from the beginning, many Rwandans had been pulled into the church through political, material, or social security influence without deep conversion. So what happens? My friends are killing, and I'm going to pick up a bolo, basically, because that's how most of the killing was done, is, is, is with these large farm knives. I'm going to pick up a bolo, and I am going to kill. There was even reporting, can you believe it, of Adventists killing other Adventists. 
um, um, luring them into a church meeting and then killing them because they were of another ethnic group. So we're not only talking about missing members here, we're talking about members who are actually engaged in a genocidal practice. Um, Rwanda is almost a totally Christian country, but because of the genocide, it shows just how superfi su superficial that Christianity was. Lastly, I'd like to talk about a very important, at least in this section, lastly, um, the, the uh, next quotation by Ellen White. Notice what Ellen White says in this very interesting quotation, Second, 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 second Selected Messages 159. It has been the continual endeavor of the enemy to introduce into the church persons who are sent to much that is truth, but who are not converted. Now, I always thought, my friends, that Satan wanted to keep people out of the church. And we've all experienced that, where Satan works with new members to keep them away from the church. But Ellen White says here, Satan is always interested in getting his people into the church who is sent to much that is truth, but who are not converted. Now notice what they do. He, Satan, can use unconverted church members to advance his own ideas and retard the work of God. Their influence is always on the side of wrong. Notice, if someone becomes a member and they are not converted, and after a while, they become an elder, even the first elder. And you have to pastor that church. What does Ellen White say? Their influence is always on the side of wrong. So you want to bring something positive to the church board, they will oppose you. They'll be like a Judas. And my friend, it's very difficult dealing with these non-converted people. They will not listen to people. They are not teachable, which is the word disciple means teachable. They have unconverted traits. They will not listen to the pastor. They will not listen to the Holy Spirit. And they become the power in the church. And it's very difficult to move the church forward. And many pastors pass through that church very discouraged and also poisoned by the attitudes that are brought about by this type of ministry. So non-converted members can result in missing members, which is really the most innocuous or the most unharmful effect, but certainly having an unconverted, especially in leadership position, is going for many years to come, retard the work of the church. Next slide, please. Now we look at community. Um, we've seen where the conversion aspect has not been thoroughly understood or practiced in the church. Now we go to community. Um, in my dissertation on page 140, I make this statement. The communal nature of the New Testament stands in stark contrast to the emergence of the autonomous individual in modern society. Now, there you have a slide before you of two chairs facing one another. And I like to give the illustration of the trains. The trains, the passenger trains were invented in Europe. And in Europe, they had the seating where they faced one another. When the trains came to North America, which was an individualistic society, the Americans changed the seats. So instead of the seats uh, uh, facing one another, the, they moved the seats, and so now they were, um, um, they were away from one another. And that's how most of the trains are today. And that's how most of the churches, you know, in the New Testament, when they went into a house, they would face each other for the service. But now we have these big heavy pews. We have these chairs. Instead of facing one another, instead of having community, we look away from each other. And it's no wonder it's hard to um, have community within the church. The next slide. Robert, <coughs> excuse me. Robert Wolf now from Princeton University had the largest study ever on small groups in North America. He, it was like 25, 30,000 people over many years. He studied them, and this is what his conclusions were. Community is what people say they are seeking when they join small groups. Yet the kind of community they create is quite different from the communities in which people have lived in the past. 
these communities are more fluid and more concerned with the emotional states of the individual. Now, I have a picture there, typical picture of young people anywhere in the world. Here you have six, seven young people. Are they looking at each other? Are they talking to one another? No, they're looking at Facebook. They're listening to music. They're playing um, Candy Crush. And as uh, Robert Wood now says, they're being alone together. And that's what we have now. Even though people are together in an urban setting, even though they might raid, uh, ride the trains or the jeepney, basically because of earphones, because of cell phones, uh, because of texting, playing games, listening to music, uh, they have no awareness of who is around them. They're not talking to the people around them. They are just involved in their own universe. So imagine these people going to church. They're going to be in the same frame of mind. They're not going to talk to the people next to them. They're going to be self-involved in whatever they're doing. So here I have this graphic of conversion, member, and community. And I want to show you, I have this uh, fluid graphic here I'm going to press the key again and I want you to watch what happens to the member here first of all conversion goes away it's very weak and then there's no more community people are not reaching out to the member the member is alone so what happens yeah the the member dissolves there's not strong conversion the community is not active in the church and so is it any wonder that half of our members are missing that are on the book, and even less than that are discipled? Now, let's look at, um, in each of the three areas, um, how we can do a better job. This is on care genuity. I'd like to first uh, talk about conversion. First of all, I think we need to develop a theology, a better theology of conversion, baptism, and ordination. Now, I have this table here, and I did a study in the Old and the New Testament. And what I studied was, is who baptized in the Old and the New Testament? And who was baptized? Who was the minister? Who was baptized? And what was the miracle? And there's two things I found out in this table. Number one, as far as the minister is concerned, each of the baptisms in the Old Testament there was a significant person in, in view of the baptism. Moses baptized the people at the Red Sea. Elisha with the story of Naaman. John the Baptist, of course, baptized Jesus. The apostles were to baptize the nations. Peter baptizes uh, at, at Pentecost. Philip baptizes the Ethiopian eunuch. And Ananias is baptized by uh, um, um Ananias baptized Paul in Acts 9. So the first thing I like to say is, I think it's very clear in our theology that only a duly ordained person, you can't self-baptize. There's no self-baptisms. Even though um, Naaman was in the river alone, he was there in a sense because Elijah had sent him. There, there is no self-baptism. A lay person cannot baptize. A duly designated person by the conference, either through ordination or, or, or by a designation by the conference or the mission, can baptize. The second main thing I would like to say about a conversion is that at each of the baptisms mentioned here, and there's more of them, um, there was a miracle. With Moses, the Red Sea opens. Elisha, um, his leprosy is healed. At John the Baptist... The Father and the Holy Spirit come. Uh, with Peter, they're speaking in tongues. Um, with Philip, of course, the Spirit takes him away. And with Ananias, Paul's sight is healed. It's amazing to me that at each of the baptisms in the Old and New Testament, there's not only a duly ordained pastor or minister, but there's also a miracle involved with the baptism. And I really feel that at each of our baptisms, uh, we should have, we should be able to stand in the baptismal tank and say, glory came down and uh, heaven came down and glory filled my soul. This person is here through a miracle of God's grace. This is a witness to the continuing miracle of God's grace in the church. So I think conversion, miracles at baptism, the congregation needs to see it. They need to hear it so they can understand what important aspect of baptism the rest of the Christian life is. 
Um, the second thing I'd like to talk about is community. Um, I would really like to, especially with the young people, encourage the church to use social network and smartphone opportunities. You know, we have a saying in the U.S., if you can't beat them, join them. So to me, the way to get in contact with people today is through Facebook, through texting, through calling, through the smartphone. So I think the church is way behind Facebook, Twitter, these other type of technologies um, I think a a a a, a well uh, uh, a, a a well informed pastor and his young people should be constantly contacting people through email, Facebook, chatting, texting, in, in in order to keep the social network. God has provided this this opportunity. As you know, in a large city, it's rare you you would see another member, but they're only a text away, even if they're in another country or in, or another part of the world. So I think this is a very important thing as part of the modern community God wants us to form that we use uh, in a positive way the social networks that are in our midst. As it says here, if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. Um, obviously, um, we want to also develop uh, this not the work done thoroughly for one soul is done for the many. We have to focus on the one soul, not the many souls. We have to thoroughly convert one soul so that they will have that DNA, that they will be able to, to reproduce their conversion experience. And um, as, as the parable in Matthew 13 says, um, um, some increase 30, 40, 50, 100 fold. And it's those people we want to convert both the members in the church that are currently there and the new members that are coming. That is my presentation on conversion, community, and care, care genuity, and I would enjoy any questions that you might have. Thank you so much for your wonderful presentation, Pastor Park. Now it's time, time for questions and answers. And if you have any question, you can just ask to him directly. If we can have uh, that uh, mic yes. passed okay. on, then you can just introduce yourself a little bit about yourself, then ask any question to him directly. Check. Any question? Okay. Here is one question, Pastor Park, for you. Hello, doctor. This is Pastor Dumura, your student from AUP. When Is that Pastor Amaral? Yes, yes, doctor. When, I, we, were, when we were students... I, you're the head of the theology department now, huh? Yes, sir. <laughs> and and you, were, you were my mentor. I mentioned you in my devotional message this morning. And okay. I remember you taught us a paradigm when we were your students about the thesis in discipleship. Yeah. Okay? The yeah. thesis, remember. Yeah. Now it's a different, uh, it's a different paradigm, different thesis now. How are you going to relate the former thesis to your new thesis that you're that you're presenting to, to us today? Well, you know, yeah, I kind of made up. A, yeah, thank you for that question, um, um, Julio. Um, um, I kind of made up a new word, care, ge care genuity. Care How genuity. are we to care for the members? Because I see that many, many churches might even be active in ministry, but the conversion and the, com the, com the community specifically are very weak. So I'm focusing on the same three C's because conversion really goes with com com community. community. And of course, com community is the same. Care genuity is what does the church deal with these missing members and these non discipled members? So it's somewhat parallel to what I taught before. Okay. So what about commission? <laughs> commission well, that's the community third part. commission. Yeah, that, yeah, yeah, yeah. As I said, um, personally, I think look on the AUP campus. Um, I would have a core group of young people who are um, dedicated to reaching out to their fellow students on a daily basis. Uh -huh. 
through Facebook and through texting. Um, I think even within that small campus, um, that would be a very fruitful exercise. We have to care care for one another because you would never know when people are are ha have a problem. Uh, maybe be, be between the Sabbath, they have a problem and they need a friend. So um, it's basically saying the same thing. I just coined a different word for it. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome, Pastor. Here is one question. Yes. Please come to the front and so that we can see your picture. <laughs> Good morning, Dr. Park. I am uh, Pastor Mugina. Hello. Hello, sir. Hello. Hello, hello. Hello, hello. <laughs> Do you hear me, sir? Do you hear me? I, I hear you. Okay. My, my question is uh, on conversion. Uh, I would like to I would like to ask your uh, comment on this. You know, when I was uh, newly pastor in the district, there was a time in our leadership, especially here in the Philippines, that pastors or uh, the church leadership is becoming more interested on figures. And uh, whenever there uh, there was a meeting of uh, pastors, they hailed those who have uh, reached one hundred. Uh, baptisms and they are uh, praised by our leaders and there's uh, nothing wrong with that but the problem was that you know those pastors are encouraged to 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 produce uh, more baptisms and that's why the newly generation of pastors are more interested on figures regardless of the quality of uh, members they baptize what can you say about this well, obviously, my whole presentation is a um, critique of the practice of some areas in the world, not 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 restricted to the Philippines or some places in Africa, Central America, South America, that have a very um, um, vigorous push by the administration for baptismal numbers. I showed you in my first slide that the book membership has very little reality dealing with the, both the attendance or the disciple members and that's what they're looking at and it's unfortunate because what you emphasize is 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 basically what you get um, I feel pastors your age um, there's there's starting to be a change um, I think even within the Filipino church where um, high baptismal numbers uh, perhaps in the future, uh, will not be so urged, and a more holistic, long-term uh, conversion nurturing plan will be put into effect, what, which ultimately, I think, will actually win more members than the short-term evangelism campaign that, 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 that might get the book membership up, but really does not have a high retention as far as a fruitful discipleship. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. So when you become conference president, please um, be a merciful to yes. the pastors and uh, work with them. Here is another question from Dr. Prema Gaikwad. Oh, Dr. Prema. Yes. My good neighbor, how about you? <laughs> yeah, we miss you neighbor? so yeah, much. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, yes, uh, I really appreciate. Uh, your concept about the care genuity idea, and I'm really touched by that. But I'm shocked and I shudder when I think of this idea that you brought, that leaders of the church and members can be agents used by Satan to deviate members from the church and not bring new members to church. <sighs> Now, what can we do about this phenomena? Uh, I may be such an agent. How do, how do I know? And how, how do we detect the sickness? How do we, what can we do about this? Well, um, um, it's interesting that Ellen White clearly tells us in Steps to Christ 
that no sooner does one come to Jesus that then there is born in their heart a desire to make known to others what a precious friend he has found in Jesus. So again, if a person is thoroughly converted, they will automatically become mission-minded because of their conversion. The woman at the well was thoroughly converted. She brought the whole town to Jesus. Jesus didn't have to tell her, go and, and bring your brethren. Um, the, the water of life, as Jesus said, went in her and, and, and it flowed out of her, blessing to others. So to me, conversion is a major key, not only for the personal salvation of the individual, but also as a primary motivating factor that, that will urge that person forward to be an effective witness. And so, to me, once a person is converted, everything else is easy. Uh, their lifestyle is in harmony, they're coming to church, they're witnessing, they want to work for God, they want to obey God, and that is what we need to seek to implant in all of our members, both old and more established members in the church. Okay, another question. Hey, Dr. Park, I have a question. Um, in your presentation, you... Um, yes, is this my friend from CPAC? No, uh, uh, from uh, sure. AUP, Ron Hennebago. Oh, AUP. AUP, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. My question is regarding conversion. Uh, you said uh, okay. in your presentation that we need to examine, we need to right. be careful in before right. uh, uh, we need to observe them before we right. baptize these uh, uh, candidates. But my question is, how short is short, or how long would be our observation before we baptize? Okay. Because like the woman at the well, it's instant. Yeah. We have here Ignatius and Cristo, they baptize after six months, I think, if I'm not mistaken. So how can yeah. we observe this? Well, you know, that's an excellent question. Let me answer it in, in, in two stages. Number one, yeah, conversion obviously can be um, fairly instantaneous. It can also be after a long time. And Ellen White is very clear. Um, both of them are regulated by the Holy Spirit. Uh, some are um, instant conversions, but she also says, it might have been the process of a long wooing by the Holy Spirit, the person then commits themselves. So um, I was converted in one night listening to one sermon, and it was very interesting. I went to the pastor and said, I want to be baptized. Now this pastor, I, and I could tell you, I was, I was thoroughly converted. But the pastor, I think, was very wise. He said, Jim, I really appreciate you wanting to get converted. Since I'm going to baptize you, why don't we study two, three times? and then um, we will proceed with the baptism. I think the deeper question, though, is how does a person know another person is convert converted? If conversion is the gateway into authentic Christian ministry and membership, how then can you tell? And my standard answer is this. The only way you can tell a person is converted is that you have to be converted. If a, if a pastor is not converted, how in the world is he going to know the signs and the, 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 the first inklings of conversion? Um, spiritual things are spiritually discerned. And I feel a thoroughly converted person can, when they get with someone, can see the early stages of conversion because they've experienced it themselves. And so I think it's very important that we as a ministry first are converted. We know what conversion is, and we can see this conversion in a very early stage in the individual, even when they're eating pork, even when they're not keeping Sabbath, even when they're living with someone. We can see that they are starting to have a hunger for spiritual things, and we can nurture that flame until they become full members and obedient to what the Bible wants them to do. Thank you so much for your answer. There's one other question. Please come to the front and introduce a little bit about yourself to Dr. Park. Okay. Uh, Dr. Jim Park, I hope you know me. <laughs> okay. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I have one question. Maybe people may think he's not seminary student. That's why his question is very radical. 
Uh, like you said, uh, community and uh, the baptism by ministers, Moses, and many others. And at the same time, like Dr. Prema brought here, you know, very yeah. interesting and very, you know, important uh, point that even Satan is also working within the church. And I strongly believe we are in remnant church, and that's why he's struggling more. He's okay. He's not worried about other places, other religion. I strongly believe that. Mm. But how about the rectification? Rectification, if something is going on, like I know with my limited knowledge, like Jesus said, if anybody causes other person, other soul to stumble, mm. what is the punishment? What is the consequences? We know that very well. What did he say? Tie the stone of the mill. If people don't know the mill, big stones, right? And tie yeah. around his neck. And I, I, I do consider it's not like uh, directly doing it literally, but you know the consequences, how Jesus took it. And you mentioned it, yeah, there are people who are being led by Satan within the church, especially the position holder or uh, the leaders or missionary or we members also. So what do you say about that? How to rectify that? Well, <laughs> um, there is no more difficult situation a pastor faces than dealing with non-converted leadership within the church. It is what it is gives the pastors, it is the Garden of Gethsemane experience. It is a very difficult experience. It's a very trying experience. And um, um, it takes a lot of wisdom dealing with these people. I can tell you the, uh, the conference, if it's a wise conference, should be somewhat aware of the situation and be ready to back the pastor um, if he needs backing as far as uh, trying to move the church forward in a wise way. But um, um, dealing with non-converted church members, where Ellen White says their influence is always on the side of wrong. Um, this is at the church board meeting, nominating committee meeting, worship meeting, in the choir, in the Sabbath school class, be before the sermon, after the sermon. Their influence is always on the side of wrong. Um, um, in my opinion, the conference should have a knowledge of these people and should alert the pastor, stand with the pastor, and help him deal with these people so that the church in some ways can uh, begin to be a blessing again. Okay, thank you for your answer. We still have four more minutes. Is there any <coughs> other question? Okay. Let me just say one more thing. Yes. Um, I emphasize uh, community. My friend, don't assume that if people come to church, they are being connected with one another. You must intentionally, in the church, help them to connect with one another. However you're going to do that, but don't assume some of the loneliest people in the world come to church and no one talks to them. No one knows what's going on in their lives, not even the pastor. And so in the Sabbath school class, in the fellowship meal, when people are greeted, members must be aware of their responsibility to get to know these people, to love these people, to minister to these people. And this is one of the major components that will lead to a healthy church. And the, con and, and the conversion of the members. Okay, thank you so much, Pastor Park, for your presentation. It okay. was very wonderful. Okay, thank you. Yes. God bless you. Yes, more. good night. Okay. Uh, right after this uh, service, we're going to have lunch. Lunch is provided. And after lunch, we have to come back for first presentation of the afternoon at 1 p.m. So please be on time. We're very delighted you came here. And now shall we stand up for the closing prayer for this morning session? Shall we ask our president to offer the prayer? Dear Lord in heaven, we thank you so much for this morning 
that we have the wonderful blessings from above, that we can learn a lot about the discipleship from the Bible, Ellen G. White, as well as from the different contexts in Asia. We pray that all of these messages can go, uh, can enter our heart, that strength our faith. And also as we uh, finish this morning sessions, uh, bless us as we partake the meal. Give us the good health and this afternoon will continue to our uh, foreign. We pray in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.